Welcome to the third and final part of this series on robots, operating systems, and robot operating system. We'll finally be getting to Robot Operating System 2, or ROS 2. You might be wondering who this ROS guy is that all the robotics people keep talking about. So let's again consider the coffee fetching robot from part one. The robot that you order to get coffee and then it thinks about it and then goes and does it for you. What all is needed to make this work? So you're going to need some sensors. For example, LiDAR, an inertial measurement unit, camera. You're going to need some computer vision algorithms, some localization and mapping algorithms, path planning, a state machine to manage what your robot's doing, some kind of control algorithm, and then that control algorithm needs to talk to the motor driver, which then talks to the motor. Lots of different modules need to be made to make this work. And then on top of that, they all need to talk to each other. So imagine if you had to do this for every single advanced robot you built. That would be really infeasible. It would take forever. Nothing would get done. So this problem of having to create so many modules, that is what ROS was created to address. ROS is a framework for programming robotic systems. So one of the major things it provides is a standard way of communicating between different software modules. So a bunch of people can independently develop robot software with their own programming languages and have them be able to talk to each other over a middleware or a communication layer between those programs. It also bundles useful tools for robotics work that leverages these communication methods. So you have visualization frameworks, uh, simulation frameworks that all are designed around being able to communicate with each other through ROS. It's not a literal operating system. It's not like Linux. It's not really worrying about the day-to-day -day interactions between the hardware of your computer and the software. It's more so about communicating between those individual robot programs. So the big idea of ROS is with this standard framework, people can collaborate and create modules and share them with each other. And those modules can talk to each other because you've got this standard communication method. That being said, ROS is a large and complex framework and it can be daunting to learn. But generally the idea is that it is such a powerful tool that it is worth learning how to use it and definitely easier to learn it than having to reinvent all of the infrastructure yourself. There's some things you should know before getting started with ROS. First, ROS works best on Ubuntu. ROS releases coincide with Ubuntu versions. Ubuntu has become a de facto standard in the robotics community. And as a result, adopting it is going to be the most frictionless way forward. There are many ways you can install Ubuntu. You can dual boot, for example, or use a virtual machine or Docker. There's a lot of tutorials on the internet. I would recommend looking at several methods and deciding what's best for you. In our group, we use ROS2 Humble on Ubuntu 22 as of today. This probably will not be best for you, depending on when you're watching this video. And the major languages that are supported in the ROS framework are Python and C++, but with such a large community, people have created bindings for Java as well as Rust, and I'm sure there will be more programming languages. As I said, communication is a major component of what makes ROS useful and nodes and topics are a big part of that. In order to get a better understanding of how nodes and topics work, we'll first go with a metaphor, specifically how YouTube distributes its videos. You might be subscribed to our YouTube channel, and there are several people who upload to the YouTube channel. So let's say I come along, and I've got a new video, and I publish it to the channel. Well, you're going to get a ping as a subscriber, right? And then you're going to see the video in your feed, you're going to watch the video, and then probably tell your uninterested friend about how awesome the Marine Robotics Group is. 
in that example, I publish and you subscribe. And then when you get that data, that video that you've subscribed to, you go and do something with it. This is very similar to the publish subscribe architecture or PubSub. And I don't mean the ones that Publix, though I do hear they are good. In ROS, you've got a similar way of sharing data. Let's say you've got a webcam driver and it needs to share a camera stream with the perception software. It's going to create a message with the information of the image and it's going to publish it to what's called a topic. So a node is an individual program, which is kind of like a user on YouTube. And a topic is like a YouTube channel. The node publishes the data to the topic and then the nodes that are subscribed to the topic get the data. And then once they get the data, they do something with it. And that is called a callback function. So to recap, topics are where messages go, like a YouTube channel as collects videos. Nodes are programs which publish and subscribe, like a YouTube user. Messages are the packets of data that get sent, kind of like the video themselves on YouTube. And then callback functions are what are done in response to the new data that has arrived via a subscription. Now, our example was one-to-one, -one, but you can have multiple publishers and multiple subscribers. Multiple programs can publish to a topic, and then it's pretty common for multiple programs to listen to what's being published. Now, as we're not getting into the technical details of how to use ROS in this series, you don't really need to memorize this, but this is just generally what a message looks like. A message is a collection of data fields. In this example, you've got an image and there's a header with some metadata, height and width information, and then the actual data itself. It's like an object in program. The PubSub architecture is very powerful, but there are some situations where different paradigms work better, and that's where services and actions come in. All right, so continuing the video metaphor, maybe this video isn't meant to be shared with the world. Um, or maybe it's a specific request for a very specific video. A user could message me to send a video. That's a request, and then I could just directly send them the video back or a response. This direct messaging-esque model is the call and response model. This is the model that ROS services use. Let's say you have a perception node and it's gotten new camera data and it wants it segmented. And you've got a dedicated program that does segmentation of images. The perception is the client and it can make a request to the segmentation's get segmented image service. The service gets the request and then it sends back a response with that segmented image. Like your standard ROS topic, it's not one-to-one, -one, but there is only one service server. You can have multiple clients, but there's only one server for each ROS service. This is what a service definition looks like. There is a definition for what data goes into the request and a definition for what data goes into the response. All right, but what if the request takes a while? Let's say you're asking me to make a new video. So you sent me a goal, make me a new video. Well, it's going to take a while, right? You might be asking me a few hours later, what's going on? I just send you feedback. It's 15% done. It's 58% done. And then once it's finally done, I send you the completed video. This is called the client server pattern and Ross actions use this for things that might take a little more time. Let's say you are navigating. You've got a navigation program saying, all right, control, let's move to X equals 1.2 and Y equals 2.3. Send it the goal, tells you how many meters you are away. Oh, you're a little closer now. 
and then it sends you a result that you have moved to the requested position. The main difference here from a service is that there's the possibility of feedback, but there's also another difference. That other major difference is the potential to preempt or cancel the action. Maybe you're on the move and something tells your navigation software, oh no, there's an obstacle in the way that wasn't there before. It can send a stop command and stop the action in its tracks. While actions are their own thing, under the hood, you can see that there's actually services and topics underlying it. Now an action looks very similar to a service, but with an additional definition of the data that's sent for feedback at the bottom. We've got three major paradigms in ROS for communication. When do we use each one? Well, topics are best for streams of data, things coming in from your sensors like video or audio. Services are best for quick requests like calculations, things, like image processing, where you just want something returned really quickly. You can think of it as a function call almost. And then actions are best for, well, actions. Things that take a while, that might fail, or need to be canceled because something came up. Now we're gonna talk about how we actually bundle ROS programs. As we discussed earlier, nodes are individual processes, basically programs. They communicate with other ROS programs via topics, services, and actions, and they can do more than one. In fact, nodes will often have both topics, services, and actions going on. Nodes should be pretty specific in terms of purpose. You don't want a node that's running your entire robot. You want a node that's running something like just a camera. And Nodes should be written to be configurable and reusable. Let's say you have multiple cameras and they all have different IDs. You should be able to configure that in a setting instead of hard coding it in your program or your node. In fact, making your nodes reusable and reconfigurable is where these things called parameters come in. Parameters are basically settings for your nodes. Let's say, again, you've got sensors with different IDs. The driver can only communicate to one sensor at a time, so you're probably going to need multiple drivers, one for each sensor. But you don't want to rewrite it three different times for three different sensors, so if you add the ability to load in parameters, you can instantiate three of the same driver, but with different IPs to talk to. All right, we've got nodes, we've got parameters, we've got to run a bunch of nodes to get our robot up and running. How do we do that? Well, that's what launch files are for, aptly named. Nodes have specific purposes, and you need multiple nodes to make a robot. So when we want to start up multiple nodes, we use what's called a launch file to specify what nodes you want to launch at the same time. And what launch files can also do is they can load in parameters and arguments so you can configure the nodes at launch. All right, we've got nodes, parameters, launch files, and message definitions. They all have to go somewhere. So they get wrapped up nicely into what's called a ROS package. Packages should also be scoped, not quite as narrowly as a node, but they should have a theme to them. Like a package should cover something like perception or localization broadly, but not cover all the robots functions, for example. One good way of learning about ROS packages is taking a look at some common ones that are published. And when you look there, you're going to see a few common files. Package.xml is information about the package, who maintains it, what are the dependencies of the package that need to be installed, then the nodes are going to be found in either the SRC folder, which is for source code that needs to be compiled like C++, or a folder with the same name as the package because this is the folder for Python code for 
ROS packages that are primarily written in Python. Parameters are typically found in a folder called config, so for configuration, and then launch contains the launch files. Message definitions are in message for standard ROS topic messages, SRV for services, and then action for actions. Oftentimes you'll find that messages are in separate packages from everything else because you want multiple packages to be able to use them because they both need to be able to reference the same message types to talk to each other. When you look at a full set of robot software, you'll usually see these two packages. Bring up, which gets everything up and running. You'll see launch files setting up the sensors and your actuators, things like that. Description tells you how your robot is physically configured. You might want to know how wide your robot is for mapping and navigation purposes. And you might also want to know, say, where your actuator is. You might want to visualize it. Description is a whole topic in itself. And we won't be getting into it, but these two packages are typically essential. At the end of this series, we're still at the tip of the robotics iceberg. ROS is a complex and powerful tool that will take a while to learn. And that's just the framework. We're not even talking about the actual robotics algorithms here. But hopefully, with these concepts, you'll be able to contextualize the tools as you learn them and be able to get into the real robotics work sooner. I'd recommend going through the ROS tutorials and if you've made it this far, thanks for watching and good luck.